granddaughter who had gum surgery. Our son-in-law Rick has had been in the hospital and out now, but the kidneys don't still have a pass in the okay. uh, Son-in-law with kidneys. Okay. 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 Well, let us spend some time in quiet meditation as we ponder these that have been offered and, and any that are on your heart, uh, silent prayers, and then we'll conclude our time of silence with the uh, Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, Let us take a moment or so to uh, greet one another with a sign of peace. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Ann. Hi,
I don't know if they'll be on the screen or not, but the words are just really um, special. And I ended up kind of moving my sermon sort of to this song, because uh, I thought it had a lot of power to it. And it says maybe what we need to hear. This is Canticle of the Turning by Rory Cooney. It's a song called Canticle of the Turning. <laughs> is that on? Rory Cooney. Is this on? A pretty loud voice. If you're not, hello? Yes? They need to turn it up or something. <laughs> Boy, okay. There we go. My soul cries out with a joyful shout for the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the one.
Our scripture reading today is from the New International Version, Exodus 3, 1 through 14. Moses and the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites, and now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Moses' life's journey uh, seems like a pretty meandering path. He was born to a Hebrew mother. Uh, he was supposed to have been killed, but the two midwives, who were also Hebrew, Shifra and Pua, Pua, that's an unusual name. <laughs> they were Hebrews, and they decided not to kill. They broke the, the law, essentially, and did not kill Moses. And so Moses' mother uh, had the baby for about three months or so and before she decided that he would be found out. And uh, so she put, built the, the basket and floated it down the river. And I imagine you know the story. And there he was found by the Egyptian Pharaoh's daughter. And she decides to raise that child in the palace. Um, and on hand, when she's pulling it from the water or having people with him, her uh, pull him out of the water, his sister Miriam was sort of lurking around. So she went to the Pharaoh's daughter and said, I know someone who could be the wet nurse for this baby. And so, uh, so Moses ended up being with his uh, biological family for a couple of years before then going to the palace to live there and grow up to be a young man. When he was a young man, he saw a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian, and he killed the Egyptian. He made sure first nobody was looking. Uh, but after that, then, he decided he better get out of town. So he ended up in Midian, 
And in Midian, he ran upon um, a group of young women who were feeding a flock at a stream. And uh, Moses helped them get the water and you know, was a help to them. And then when the one, they go back home, the, the one of the daughters said, uh, talk, tells her father about what this man did. And so he said, well, did you, well, did you ask him to dinner? And she said, no. He said, well, we need to find him. So they did, and he was invited for dinner. Later, he ends up marrying this girl, young woman. And she, so then we get to this story uh, where um, Moses is tending the flock of uh, his father-in-law. So he was Hebrew by birth, Egyptian raised. Uh, then he ran into Midian. And by then he was a killer. Um, he marries uh, the Midian priest's daughter. Um, so he's really, you know, had a lot of twists and turns. Um, and now Moses is a foreigner, you know, in Midian. So, you know, who am I? Can you imagine his ask, you know, kind of sorting that out? You know, am I Hebrew? Am I Egyptian? You know, am I doomed to be a foreigner, you know, an outsider all the time? Um, and when he's out looking at the, uh, look, checking on the flock, he sees the bush. And in the new Revised Standard Version, instead of the words that Joni read in the NIV, uh, the way that the editors put it in the NRSV is that Moses, when he sees this, says, I must turn aside to see. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to Moses out of the bush. And God called Moses by his name, so he knows him. And he sets about telling Moses who he is, who Moses is. Yeah. As well as then, by the end of the, their encounter, Moses also learns a name for the God of the Hebrews. And that's the Yahweh name. Uh, in uh, scripture, um, most of the time when it is for Yahweh, it's Lord written in all capital letters. Because the, the Hebrews, the Israel, the Jews did not say the name of God because it was too holy to speak. So you just have Yahweh is, you know, it's kind of also a, a word to keep hushed. And, and to the spirit. You know, in many ways, Moses was a logical choice for the job because he did have, you know, Hebrew and Egyptian in him in various ways. Uh, but as the scripture points out, Moses is not sure, you know, at all that he has what it takes. And he questions that really all along the way. Uh, as he does leave them out. They go into the wilderness. They wander for 40 years. Um, and then he gets to just at the edge of the promised land. And his job is done. Um, that's where he dies. The life of faith, we have found, I assume you have, um, that our, our lives are full of meanderings and turning aside. Uh, there are times we know and choose, we think we know what we're doing, and we choose and we head down that path. And it works well, uh, things go well. And then there might be a spot in, the, in that path then, well, hmm, let me think about this, turn aside to this way. Uh, and then we go that way for a ways. It may be great, it may not be. In which case, if it's not, then we probably do another turn aside. And sometimes we're not the one who initiates that turn. There's all kinds of things that come into our lives that are not at all what we would choose. And somehow or other, God makes use of all of that. And God is present with us in all of that. When I was uh, teaching uh, high school English, the path was, the first two years of teaching were difficult. But after that, I just kind of walked uh, pretty straight path and didn't, uh, I mean, there were, you know, day-to-day -day challenges, but for the most part, I felt like I was doing, doing good work, and uh, uh, I kind of had some identity of myself. I was Miss Wishon, I knew who she was. Um, but then I started getting restless, you know, maybe a little bored, I'm not sure. 
So I started looking around for what else is there? You know, what, what else is out there? And when I say out there, I really think what I was looking for was a way to leave home. You know, was a way to leave, to leave Yankee County and, and see the world, you know, the wider world. Uh, but at that point, when I was doing that rest, wrestling with what's next, um, I no, in no way thought I would ever be doing what I ended up doing in the ministry, that I would ever be a pastor. And I'm here to tell you that pastor route was full of challenges. <laughs> um, I was never bored again. <laughs> but the, the gift that it was for me was that I absolutely had to live in faith. That was the gift. And, and, and actually, I know I had that gift all along that, because I've always known God, and God has always been present for me. Now, there are times when I couldn't, I couldn't see um, a way ahead, and there were times that I, I never doubted God's uh, presence in my life, but there were times when it was really tough to know it, you know. Um, but the gift for me then was, was the faith gift that perhaps you have, um, I'm not sure we all get that gift, you know. For some of us, believing is difficult, you know, in, uh, believing in a God, or believing in the God of the way Christians tell it, or Buddhists talk about the great, you know, the great spirit, you know, the Hindu, you know, all the different religions, uh, trying to get out what it is that transcends this right here. Faith becomes then more than a path, it becomes the container for everything that is. And then turning aside to see um, that Moses did, you know, we end up uh, finding, even within that, the meanderings that God is present. All of us are still on a journey, because we're still here. Um, I mean, some of us may be feeling that, that we're getting toward the end of the end of the road, um, and that's a bit scary for me, I'll uh, share with you, uh, it's this idea of growing older and, and one day not existing in this way. You know? I, you know, when we were doing this, this time of celebration with uh, Bill Donahue, um, I was you know, about to think about what would, I, what would I want included you know, in mine, and talk about pictures and things that could be made a video. And then I think, I realize, I'm not going to be there. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not no longer going to be worried about all of that. And somebody else can choose that stuff, you know. And if nobody's left, because <laughs> I am running out of family, uh, then whatever. <laughs> One of my uh, heroes in the faith is named James Finley. He's done a lot of work about spirituality and uh, written on some volumes that are pretty much uh, standard. And he now works with uh, Richard Rohr out in New Mexico. He, he tells that he was extremely abused as a child. And he writes about it saying this, as I look back, what most stands out to me is the truth of the awakening heart. This truth is the surprising realization that from the hidden depths of a darkness too terrible to name or explain, God can emerge as a sovereign, silent presence that carries us forward, amazed, and grateful into realms of clarity and fulfillment that we could scarcely have imagined. It's amazing that um, out of that childhood, and even in the midst of it, he was uh, raised Catholic, so even in the midst of that, he was doing his prayers with his rosary uh, and came to know uh, and then as an adult, again, you know, also doing the looking back and the sorting through that and, and knowing that God was present all along uh, 
as the gift that, that we we have to work a little bit to get to that gift to begin to uncover the layers you know that we've got up or, you know our uh, facade that we wear and the things that we tell ourselves so that we kind of pump ourselves up we kind of have to get behind all that and under all that to begin to see that yes god is present i remember uh, when i was working in ardmore united methodist as the associate I taught the disciple Bible classes, and um, almost every year that I taught it, somebody in the group would have a, a, a loss, would lose a loved one, or else have a very serious illness. And one year, it was the death of a, a little boy named William with cancer. He was seven or eight years old. Um, and I walked with that mom and dad, you know, through the rest of my time there, and even a little bit beyond. Um, and it was a horrible thing to happen, you know, to lose a child. But I, I saw, from my vantage point, the growth, the spiritual growth that happened in both of them. That they, that they and it would never make up for, you know, you never should make up for the loss of a child. There's just no saying that's okay in any way. But they were able to move beyond that and through it, through it, definitely through it, you know, to, to, to another side of it, uh, and to be able to, to, to grasp the uh, power that God has for us. Surviving the turns is one of the ways that we gain strength you know, for the journey. Uh, it's also how we gain hope for our world, for the world at large. Uh, we hope for a world that uh, has no child abuse, no any kind of abuse, no misogyny, no racism, you know, no violence. And that world that God hopes for us is a world worth striving for and turning aside for. Um, Julian of Norwich um, was a um, an amazing Christian uh, way back, you know, in the mid Middle Ages, basically. Um, and she sequestered herself in a little um, a hermitage, like an addition, just a little cell next to the, attached to the uh, church. And she lived there. She had a window, and people would come for her to pray. They wanted her to pray with them. And, but she was tended to, uh, but stayed in that little cell for the rest of her life. And she had some amazing experiences that, we, that assured her that God is real and God is true, that God is powerful, that God loves us, loves us with a capital L. And despite the fact that she was missing so many things that I can imagine missing out on, um, she knew, she knew, and she shared that God is love. She said about sin that sin, uh, we don't really need to feel guilty about sin because all we need to do when we recognize the sin in our lives is to just run into the hands of God, into the arms of God. And that's all that's necessary. Uh, that, that that is the thing that God is, is longing for us. And that that's what the faith and the hope are, are running into the arms of God and allowing God to hold us up and to make us new and to give us strength. So when we turn uh, with faith and we turn within faith, we're working to realize you know, the hope. We're working so that other folks can experience hope that the world can grow in harmony with each other. Um, it sounds like it's almost impossible. Uh, but the thing is, with God, it is possible. It is possible. And sometimes it's not the condition that we might be living in, but it would be the, uh, the understanding that beneath that is God and that God is holding us up. Our community, our world, our individual, um, those deep moments that we have are God's gift to us. Amen.
We are going to share together uh, with uh, Holy Communion. Now we're doing the circle around the perimeter today, so let me give you a little bit of instruction, and then we'll move on to the to the other things that just preceded. Um, the communion folk servers today will come up and get a basket of bread and a tray, and then we will come out of our pews and make the circle around. And then the basket will go around to the middle and then this side, and then the, the trays will come after that and take the whitest grape juice, the darkest mine. Um, and just hold on to them as you're standing there. And then when, when everybody's been served, we will imbibe together. Uh, and then we'll stay there and sing the last song, which is Blessed Assurance. But before we get there, let's, let's pause for an advertisement from our sponsor. <laughs> uh, have you ever wondered what you could do with that money? <laughs> Well, we have just the right place. Um, it can go in the offering plates. If the folks who are going to pass the plate will come up or go back and get the, the plates. Or you can uh, donate by going online and uh, there's a button there to push. And there's also uh, one of those funky looking squares. Um, and you can mail it. And I thought Larry gave us a good, just go, good um, explanation earlier about the passing of the plates uh, and the value in that. So let us receive our offering. Stay seated, that we've, we've got a little tray for you, so it'll be brought to your pew. Or if you just want to work your way back to the end of the pew, you can sit. Uh, so whatever makes, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> whatever's comfortable. In the way of announcements, uh, Craig left me with uh, three, and then um, Nancy, uh, Nancy's whose last name starts with a V. Sorry about that, Nancy. Um, Jan Sawyer will be having a recital here in the sanctuary this coming Saturday, the 7th, um, at 2 o'clock, and she's doing it to celebrate her birthday. Uh, so we're all invited to be, to be there. Uh, and if you're a single woman, <laughs> you can meet us at 12.30 at Mayberry's uh, for lunch on Saturday, and then we'll come on to the recital. <clears throat> 
We still need uh, three more people um, in order to do the Soul of Aging course this fall. So if you've been thinking about it, pondering it, um, go ahead and, and make that commitment. It is a wonderful uh, experience. Lisa, uh, I did it twice. I loved it. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about being at least one of those three and doing it again. So because it's well worth doing. Yeah. And the nurture will meet today after church. And then the uh, announcement that Nancy wanted me to share with you, if you didn't catch it in the newsletter, is that uh, next weekend, uh, uh, and of course when you're up here you forget all anything you know. Um, <laughs> All the names just go away. But it's um, the fellow at um, Wentz Memorial, who's a drama person and has a little theater company. He has written a musical called Remus. Uh, Remus the Musical. And uh, it will be on Friday evening and then Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. So if he, uh, is it Bonnie? Is that his name? Bonnie. Yeah. 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 So he, it's his, and uh, you know that Wentz is our sister church, and uh, he was one of the seven, seventy this year. Yeah. Uh, won that honor in the community, and he's ninety-four, you know, and just wrote a musical. So kind of gets makes me a little embarrassed, but I have done more than that. You know. Any other announcements this morning? Lonnie is a woman. Oh! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's award-winning. Um, she's featured in the park next to um, Salton Center. Yeah. There's a, a, a special plaque in her honor. She is an award-winning theater person. Yeah. Well, you know, when I thought, when uh, Nancy said that he I thought she said he, but she probably, I mean, she just wrote it to me, uh, that she was a seven of, of 70. I thought they were all women this year, so I had me confused. Okay. <laughs> Thankfully, y'all know more than I do. Uh, as we, uh, as the communion servers come up and get your uh, things together, uh, we'll begin to head toward the edge of the, of the uh, perimeter of the, of the road. feeds us and nurtures us for the gifts of faith, hope, and love, for all those turnings in our lives that draw us ever closer to you, uh, sometimes further, but always back to the center. We remember that on the night in which uh, Jesus gave his life for us, that he took bread there at supper, he gave thanks, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, eat from this, all of you, this is my body. 
And after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. As often as you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. And so in these mighty acts, we give thanks for Jesus, that you, uh, that you were, uh, you lived, you were, you are, and you ever will be our Savior. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you will take the bread that we The bread of life, let us eat. And the cup of peace. And then the trays can come back this way, and you can put your empty cup in. And we'll begin with our song, which is Blessed Assurance. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>